episode number 44. When I had my near-death experiences, I didn't exit consciousness. I entered consciousness of a different form. The last five days of my mom's life, we'd have Ringo jump onto the bed, and he would nestle to her, and I know she could feel him. We'd actually place her hand on his fur. You know, you learn about cultures, and you learn about people, and especially talking to the older generation, you learn about what it was like for them 60, 70 years ago, and that's just an eye-opening experience that we I don't know where I would have found that if I wasn't in the milk truck why didn't Yoko step in and say this isn't what he wanted well she did it she oh she's the one who had him cremated yeah yeah so yeah oh, Yoko yeah I'm not going to eat anything <laughs> I'm going to stay as vague as possible okay so. <laughs> good let, let me know if you hear a drone over your house Hi, I'm Brant Huddleston. In my last show, I introduced you to an organization called the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, or CTAC, a D.C.-based organization dedicated to the ideal that all Americans with advanced illness, especially the sickest and most vulnerable among us, receive comprehensive, high-quality, personal, and family-centered care that honors their dignity. A great mission. In this episode, you will meet more people I had the privilege of interviewing at SeaTac's 2017 annual event. Tim Bauerschmidt and Ramey Little, a husband and wife team, and John Maycroft from Optum. The recordings were made on the spot, so they can be a bit noisy at times, but I think you'll find their stories inspiring. Stories about elder loved ones who have since passed, but not before those elders made important end-of-life choices for themselves. And in the case of Tim and Ramey, that choice led to a grand adventure. When Tim's mother, a widower who had just lost her husband of 67 years, learned she too was soon to die from cancer, she rejected the standard plan of surgery, chemo, and all the rest, and clearly told the young doctor, look, I'm 90 years old. I'm hitting the road. Thus began a long, wonderful journey across America with Tim, his mom Norma, wife Ramey, and Poodle Ringo. I recommend Tim and Ramey's book, Driving Miss Norma, where you can learn all about their trip. But in this episode of Dance, I was curious to learn how caregiving in such a cozy space as an RV affected their marriage and about the role Ringo played in Norma's caregiving. So let's begin this show with Tim, Ramey, and Ringo the dog. So in 10 minutes, I just wanted to talk to you about your marriage. Okay. <laughs> so first question is, how long have you been married? And I think you'll probably know the answer to that. <laughs> We've been married for 11 years together for 17 years. Okay. And any, any children? No children. No, I've been married previously. No children from my previous marriage. No. Nope. Okay. So now we're going to have a little fun with this. All right. So obviously you just took this incredible journey with your mom, who was 90 at the time. And you're in this, you know, you're all cooped up in this trailer with a dog, beautiful dog, Ringo. It's a pretty big uh, poodle. And, uh, and, and down the road you go. So, you know, this, this experience uh, certainly brought out the best and worst of everybody, probably. So my question uh, for you, Ramey, is if you were to answer for Tim, okay, pretend you're Tim, what would you say he would say were your your best and worst uh, what what was the best that it brought out in you and what was the worst that it brought out in you this is what he would say I, <laughs> wow you tricky questions right off the bat Brent. i'm bad at that yeah. i i think the best thing that that came of this trip was r- recognizing that we were capable and I was capable of being a caregiver and w- neither of us knew that either of us were capable of that and and so I think he would say that, that we did a pretty good job of of caring for Norma so so you surprised him he 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 was surprised to learn that you were as much of a caregiver as you turned out to be I yeah I would I would think so yeah Tim a good answer 
Yes, I, she she cared for my mom as if she were her own. Yes, I, and I, I really love her for that. And before all of that, were you were you kind of wondering how she would do as a partner uh, with regards to caring for an elderly person? No, Remy's always been my lodestar for keeping in touch with my family. She'd be like, shouldn't you be calling mom today or mom and dad? Or She, she was very, she helped me focus on my family. I, I was more aloof to my family, not out of animosity or anything, just but just out of my fierce independence and my, my free spirit lifestyle. Well, we also, you know, we have habits. I, my mom's 92, so, um, you know, you have a whole lifetime of treating mom this way, and then sometimes it helps to have an outside uh, friend, in, my wife also said to me not long ago, uh, "You should call your mom every day." I was like, "That's a great idea." So about a year ago, I started calling her every day. So yeah. All right, Tim, you're on the spot now. All right. Okay. All right. So, what would Ramy say? You're answering it as if you were her now. That it, it brought out the best and the worst in you. I think she's. She would say she was very proud of me for stepping up and doing this. I, 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 myself, I didn't realize I had it in me, and, and I don't know if she knew I had it in me either. Well, you guys tag team really, really well. <laughs> that, 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 that it does, it does. Yes, we are. We're 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 a well oiled unit, aren't we, Ramy? Yes. We're typically within we're typically within eight feet of each other at all times. So we're <laughs> amazing. Well, a lot of married couples probably could not do what you did uh i was speaking with a a woman last night i was going around the crowd asking different people could you do it and uh, i got this one woman who uh she lives in i think wisconsin and her husband has a business in buffalo new york and they have houses in both places and they have lots of space between them you know and i said uh could you do it and she said no i don't think that's gonna happen you know so that was pretty funny (laughs) all right last question and that is uh, what would Ringo say <laughs> if Ringo could talk? <laughs> what would Ringo say were the highlights of his experience in this whole uh, trip with your mom? I think just being with mom and 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 have a good pal like like he had. She, my mom, didn't really warm up to Ringo until this trip. She was a cat person. Ringo's large. She was kind of intimidated by him, but. It wasn't very long before she was saying, "Add a boy, that's my boy." And and Remy and I could actually, we in the beginning, we could leave leave her with Ringo and know that they were taking care of each other. So we didn't, he was a very big part of our team. He was, he was, I don't know how we would have done it without him. And I love how you said that a big part of your team because uh, when Ringo came on stage last night, beautiful uh, white uh, poodle. I thought, where are the four-legged companions in this whole SeaTac event? Is is you know we know uh, B.J. Uh, Miller referred to loneliness and isolation as being a scourge, and it, I know that it's one of the bigger problems to solve. And wow, uh, I mean, a, a pet is a fast, easy way. Well, a fast way, not an easy way, because I, I imagine. Uh, Ringo was not easy for you to care for. He's not, you know, pets take a lot of care. And uh, what were some of the challenges caring for Ringo on the trip? Well, Ringo's lived with us his whole life on the road, and and so he he's kind of used to it. I I, I really can't think of any challenges because he's just been part of our life for so long. What I what I would like to say though is that he he, he did provide a sense of safety and security for Norma. If if early on in the trip we wanted to go for a hike and left Ringo back with Norma, she was completely comfortable in in all these strange environments and campgrounds people that she didn't know you know it wasn't like living in her neighborhood and she could call the neighbor if she was afraid of something but norm ringo provided that sense of of security for her and um it it made a huge difference in in our success having him with us he was critical to the very end the last week or five days of my mom's life she was pretty much unconscious shall we say just laying in bed but we'd have Ringo jump onto the bed and he would nestle to her and I know she could feel and we'd actually place her hand on his fur and she could feel the warmth of his body and I I think that I think that was a very comforting thing for her in her last days even though she couldn't articulate anything to us she didn't have her eyes open even but we we knew that there was comfort there and he 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 was a very important part of my mom's well-being 
Wow, that that's absolutely beautiful. And a shout out to SeaTac that next year we should have uh, we should have the, our four legged companions represented more here. Thanks to Ringo for coming. And last question: Who's the Beatles fan? Actually, he's not named after Ringo. St- oh, you're kidding! Oh, no. there's, a there's a good story here. We've there's uh, the kanji characters in Japanese Rin Ringo. It literally translates to apple, but it means bearer of peace. And we, 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 when we got him, we, we, that was our intention that he was going to be a, a peace giver. So it's Ringo, but it works. People understand. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. well, in that case, I'll say Ariato. Domogato, yeah. Doi Tashtamasta. No, that just means pe- please pass the mustard. <laughs> Words matter. Which ones we choose, how we use them, and when we use them all have a huge impact on the outcome of our message. So when Optum, an innovative health services company, decided to take on the challenge of choosing which words would best encourage Americans to think through and decide future life preferences, they turned to John Maycroft. I heard John explain Optum's research at SeaTech, and I really appreciated the sensitivity, the dignity, and the care woven into the way we all need to have the conversation about end of life and the importance of having a solid advanced care directive in place, no matter how old we are. Here to talk about it now is John Maycroft. Fantastic. I am here at SeaTac 2017 with John Maycroft. Say hi, John. Hello. With Optum. So my first question is, what is Optum and what do you guys do? Sure. Uh, Optum is a health services company. So we uh, have an enormous amount of technology that's in the background in healthcare. Um, we also provide care through services like health co- house calls, um, uh, clinician networks across the country, um, and really trying to make the health system work better for everyone. Fantastic. Now, you're, you're looking like you're still a pretty young guy. I assume you, still, you have a family, yes? Yep. Uh, uh, my wife and two young boys, age one and a half and six. So I, I'm probably more tired than a lot of your listeners, <laughs> despite my age. <laughs> wow, one and a half. I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of, of some of where you are in, in life. It seems like the other side for me. So Yeah, I got to say, I got grandkids that are way older than that, and uh, the, uh, it's an easy road after uh, those. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so what got you into this? What, what um, got you involved or passionate about uh, advanced care planning? And I heard your talk yesterday, and you were so articulate on it. I said, okay, there's a fire burning in there somewhere. Tell me about that. It's just so interesting, and it's so important, and it's something that it's, it's not new. It's as, it's as old as humanity. But the basic idea that you can talk about what's important to you, what really gives life meaning, and, and the consequences for the care that you receive if you're sick, if you're in an accident, if you're not able to speak for yourself, the, the benefit and, and the burden that you remove from your family by talking about those things and what sort of decisions you would want or what, what sort of treatment you would want or not want if you couldn't speak for yourself. Um, and so the, uh, it, it's so rewarding professionally but also personally to know that I'm going much more likely to get the care that I want if something were to happen and the, the, the people I love will get the care they want because they've talked about it as well. All right, so I, I'm going to ask you to give me two scenarios, okay? A best-case scenario where somebody has done the work and, and they've, got all the, uh, they've got all the pieces in place, and then after that I'm going to give you a worst-case scenario where they haven't. So, so Jane Doe is 80 years old living alone and she's she's done all her, the right things to prepare she's done future care uh uh she's identified her future care preferences walk me through the best case scenario sure so let's let's rename jane doe to my grandma alice maycroft who passed away a few years ago at, at the age of 86 and when I was starting to get into advanced care planning, she was kind of my first guinea pig where I was talking with her on the phone. I'm like, yeah, I'm working on this thing and tiptoeing around as we all do. How do you break the ice on this conversation? And I don't even remember what I said, but I, 
finally I blurted out, well, have you thought about this? Have you talked about this? And she just opened up, like grandma had thought about this. Like, oh yes, I've lived a wonderful, full life. Um, I'm happy with everything. I believe in God. I believe I'm going to heaven. And when it's my time to go, I do not want you standing in the way of God. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want all of the crazy things like, you know, come be with me. Let me be comfortable and, and let me go with God. And, um, and, and I appreciated that, that she actually made it religious like that because it made it so that we, if, if we called 911 when something was going on, it would be getting in God's way. And that's a pretty heavy thing to do to both God and grandma. So, and, and in fact, when the, by, by talking about that and by sharing that with everyone in the family and, and we're a family with, you know, wonderful people, our fair share of weirdos and people who might've stepped in and tried to do whatever, um, one of you came clear that, that, that grandma was in her last week or so, and the call came, you know, drive, drive to Michigan if, if you want to say goodbye, now's the time to do it. Um, I did, and I, I drove seven hours around Lake Michigan from Wisconsin. I sat with her, I said goodbye, and I, I was there kind of doing nothing with her beautifully for, for 20 minutes, and nobody did freak out. Nobody did call 911. No, she got... And it wasn't fun. So, so this isn't about promising a a good time or a happy time or anything like that. But you can have something beautiful and meaningful, um, and that's what we got because she talked about it. And and if she hadn't, who knows what would have happened? Who knows where she would have died? Who knows what might have been done in, in the end scenario? And that and that's kind of the bad case. Well, let's put a little. Let's put a little twist on the story. Uh, let's say that uh, your grandmother had fallen in her house, and um, she was unconscious. EMTs came, first responders, and they found her. What happens so that those EMTs know what uh, the patient's advanced directive is? What, what is the best practice for that situation? Um, first and foremost, talk to your loved ones. Have that conversation. It doesn't need to be perfect. It doesn't have to be built around a document. You can start by talking. You know, even if it's easier to talk about what you don't want, that can sometimes be the path to, to articulating what you do want. Um, have that conversation documented in an advanced directive. There are resources at almost every health system to help with that and, and make sure that your physician has it. Um, for some, um, it's appropriate to think about a, a POLST. Or it's Physician Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. It has different names in different states. But that's a medical order so that um, for those who are seriously ill and, and where you can predict that a call to the EMT would happen, um, then it's, it, it, it resu- it's a conversation, but it results in a piece of paper that can be with you, and the EMTs will recognize it and know if you want certain forms of treatment or don't want certain forms of treatment. Um, and so having that conversation and, and documentation can, can help a great deal. Do EMTs, when they come into a house, are they trained to look, for example, on their refrigerator for a pulse form? Um, in most states. Most states now have pulsed or something similar. Sometimes it's called most, pol- most, most, post. It, it's got different names. But that's getting traction in, in probably 40 out of, out of the 50 states. The, the, the default, if you don't have the conversation, if you don't have a document, is you're going to get more medicine. They're, they're, most often they're going to pursue the surgery, the aggressive treatment, the life-saving, life-saving and life-sustaining measures, which is what some people want. And, and ethically, of course, that's what the default has to be, is, is caring for people and, and, and helping them stay alive. But a lot of people don't want that, or they want something different, or they have particular beliefs that will apply to those situations. And nobody will know that unless you talk about it. And, and so that's, that's what that conversation does. Yeah, I think of it almost like falling into a machine that just has one gear, and that is to save your life. Um, they, and so they'll pull out all the stops to do so, and, and that may not be what you want. But if you haven't I done, uh, you haven't communicated that, then you're just going to fall into this machine, and it's going to grind away, and you're going to, you know, you're going to pop out the other end with a lot of tubes in you, maybe. Yeah, you'll 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 be at the mercy of the, of the healthcare system, and um, God bless them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but but it's. Um, 
uh, again, they're they're going to have to guess what you want if, if you don't have that conversation. And their guess is always going to be save the life. That's that's their one gear. That's the way they're the, a doctor is trained from the you know that's the Hippocratic oath is first do no harm. So they're going to save. They're going to try to save your life. They'll pull out all the stops to save your life when in fact what you may want is just to die naturally. Yeah, and so a, a lot of people now I think know that this conversation is port- important, but they don't really know how to have it or, or where to start. Um, and so, uh, how do you how do you talk about this? And and really, there are some pretty simple steps. The the questions that that you need to think about in order to have a good conversation. Um, really, a lot of times it can start with reflecting on your past experiences. Um, obviously, to me, being with my grandma was really important, and that influenced how I think about um, death and dying and, and any other emergency situations. You know, the, the classmates who get in car accidents. Let's remember, this is not just for old people. This is for everyone. Um, bad things can happen at any time. Every one of us has been in a car accident. Every one of us has that high school classmate who um, had just something really bad or even in fatal happen to them. And so, um, and it's not even just end of life, it's for any time you're not able to speak for yourself. So if you think about those experiences that you've had, and maybe how you thought something like, well, I would never, I would never want to go like that, or I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that, or I really like how Grandma Alice did it, and I kind of want to, I, I want something like that. Um, that's, a, that's a good place to start, because once you've reflected on those experiences, you're in the mindset to think about, about what you would want next. What are some of the resources that you've found helpful to folks if they want to start doing their own advanced uh, planning? Is, the, is there a website they can go to, or should they go to Optum? What, what do you recommend? Sure. The, the Conversation Project is really great. Um, I believe their URL is theconversationproject.org, but you can just Google The Conversation Project. Um, there are some other online tools like um, uh, Cake. So there are these guides to, to what you need to cover in the conversation. And it's reflecting. It's choosing a healthcare agent. Yeah. After you've done that initial reflection, what are some of the next steps that you would take? Um, one of the key next steps is choosing your healthcare agent. This person will be your advocate for you if you are in a situation where you're unable to speak for yourself. This person might be the pers- person closest to you, but it might not be. Um, it's got to be someone who you trust who is accessible, who can make hard decisions, who can navigate the healthcare system, um, who, who can make decisions that align with what's important to you. Um, and so if um, I, I've certainly seen people, even my dad did a little bit, um, uh, thinking about whether my mom should be his agent. And he thought about you know, the hard decisions navigating the system, being able to go through what is a really difficult thing and that job is not for everybody. So think carefully and, and don't just go right for the person who's closest to you. Um, and then have a couple of alternates so that if that person's not available, there's someone else you can look to. In my own advanced care planning, I've picked an advocate who's a little bit hard-boiled because I know that uh, there might be some tough decisions and I don't want that advocate falling apart and getting all mushy. I want them to make clear, rational choices for me if I'm unable to do so for myself. Yeah, it's, it's a tough job, so, so think carefully about who you hire. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, what's next for Optum? Where are you guys going to go in the next year? So we've been working on the language to help people have these conversations. What will break the ice? What will provide some urgency? Because I think everybody knows that this is important, but they don't always know where to begin and and how to start and and what they need to cover. And so we've been working on that, and we want to figure out how we can get that message out moving forward to a a broader audience and connect them to more of what they need to help help have that conversation. So uh, everybody uh, everybody's going to die. So everybody theoretically should have an advanced care directive yes yep. this this is for everyone uh, right. nobody nobody should not have one here's the question if you were to take a wild guess about what percentage of the u.s population actually does have one when everyone should have one what would your guess be 30 percent of people in the statistics have some sort of document 
Um, but that doesn't mean that they've talked about it. That doesn't mean that anybody knows where to find it. It might be 20 years old, and it might be more legalistic. I think if, if you're looking at, and this is my guess, um, if you really think of who's having the conversation, documenting it in an advanced directive and making sure that it's available if something happens, I worry that it's less than 15%. So this is, this is something we need to do. Yikes. Okay, so 85% of you out there... <laughs> you need to take uh, take some action on this, and uh, there's no time like the present. Agreed? Yep. Now, do you have your care plan, Brand? I do. All right. Good going. Me too. <laughs> John, a pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show, and uh, thanks for giving us so much great information about advanced care planning. I hope you enjoyed meeting Miss Norma, a woman who at age 90 said yes to adventure, yes to love, and yes to joy. She is a person who, as John Maycroft wisely advised us to do, thought through her options, decided what was best for her, and then lived her dream. I hope her story inspires you to live yours. My dream is to have all of you go to iTunes and leave a positive review, which would inspire me to keep on keeping on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. I'd love to hear how you like the shows. You'll find me at all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, or at dancepastsunset.com, where you'll also find free goodies and a way to sign up for my newsletter. Check it out. I will leave you with a thought. Joy, happiness, adventure, and love are already in you. You were born with them in you. And while they may get clouded over with the cares of this world, the sunshine is still there. Look at any child and you'll see this is true. Our challenge as older people is to brush away the clouds and let our light shine, to rediscover the childlike sense of wonder and openness. Together, we can do it. That's it for now, boys and girls. As always, make the most of this moment wherever you are on your journey, for it's the only moment you have, and may peace be with you. This is your host, Brant Huddleston, signing off. Thank you.